People walking in unbearably hot climates in search of the last few jobs that have not yet been taken by robots or by the super rich. This is the image of the future you get listening to current discussions and the media. It seems that the future never had such a bad reputation as it has now. Even in the present age of unprecedented wealth, progress and technology, we have lost the excitement and trust that we used to hold in the future. Where our, pro where our grandparents saw flying cars, we now see doomsday scenarios. Through this keynote, the European Liberal Forum wants to show people that the situation is not that bad, that there are solutions for some, some of today's problems, that it is, it is not naive to be an optimist. For this session, we're going to take your questions, and also I would like you to ask you to uh, answer the polls that you can find at ELF Madrid hashtag. And you can also go to European Liberal Forum's Twitter handle and please answer the polls, poll questions. And please send your questions through the hashtag as well so that we're going to take your questions and take your answers to the polls at the end of the session during the discussion panel. Let me introduce the names that we're going to have here. We're going to start with Nina Ekelund. She is the executive director of Haga Ini Initiative and she will tell us about the climate change. Afterwards, we're going to have Christian Kotarski. He's the assistant professor at the Faculty of Political Science at the University of Zagreb. And he will tell us about the regard pro progress. And the last panelist we're going to have is Daniel Kadik. He is the executive director of ELF. And he will tell us about the fear in the media. Enjoy. Actually, everything we have to do is change the system. We have to overthrow this system, which is eating the planet. The world is going to end in 12 years if we don't address climate change. And this is our World War II. One of your founders, Roger Hallam, said in April, our children are going to die in the next 10 to 20 years. Yeah. <laughs> so, the question, is it this bad? Yes, it is really this bad. And science shows us we need to be under one and a half degrees. And no, because if we have alarmism, there will be no change, because people will be paralyzed. We need to think. For every negative news, we have to think on three positive news when we're going to talk about this issue. My name is Nina Ekelund. Uh, next slide, please. And I work together with uh, these companies. So I'm from the business side. So you can take the next slide. I'm just sending a message up to the, to the control room. So I work with these companies. So remember when I talk, I'm from the business side. But the good news, these companies have decided to be fossil fuel free until 2030. And that's 15 years before the Swedish government. And why are they doing it? Yes, they're doing it because it's profitable. So that's what I'm going to talk in with my speech. Other good news, not only these companies, but big businesses all around the world are, are changing and transitioning and reducing their climate impact. So it's not only these companies. And they have also started to degree, decrease their emissions and they have also started to look at new business models. So, business models that are not dependent on oil or coal or gas. And they also have started to look at business models that are climate negative. So that is the good news. For example, the big steel company in Sweden, uh, this is the biggest emitter we have, the steel company, and they have decided to, to have fossil-free steel. And they see, it's, they, they see profit out of that. For example, the district heating company in Stockholm, where I live, 
uh, they started out with oil and then we got district heating with coal and the next step they are now re taking the coal away in 2021 that's next year and instead they have uh, rest products from the forest but it's not stopped there because they also want negative emissions so they will use bio CCS and biochar to become negative emissions and they're doing it because it's profitable and H&M anyone know of that store have you bought your clothes there they have started a shop where you can rent your clothes and you can also leave your old clothes that you don't want to get uh, and get money from that the big investment company have decided and it's the biggest investor we have in Sweden they decided to tell all their companies they work with that they should half their emissions between 2020 and 2030 that's a lot and they're doing it because it's profitable but it is in critical times we live and we see the Davos the risk report from Davos we can see they asked 800 leaders uh, about the economy economy for the world and they asked them about the risks five out of all the risks are in the top are related to climate so we need to work with climate other else we will risk the economy for the world and at the same time we know we have an important meeting in Glasgow this year in November where all the countries are going to meet to discuss the deliveries from the Paris Agreement so that is also really really important at the same time we know that EU have to deliver and we last week this week we got a green deal and we got a new decision that we are going to be climate neutral in Europe by 2050 but that's not enough they didn't deliver on the 2030 target and also the 20 2040 target and that is important so business need a market economy on um, based on uh, the planetary boundaries so that is important we also need the EU ETS and that is very important because the EU ETS is delivering right now it's sending out the message it works but we need to do a sharper line we have to give business the right conditions for example we had a carbon tax in Sweden that's the highest tax the highest carbon tax in the world and we have uh, increased the GDP with 69 percent 69 percent and decre decreased emissions with over 25 percent so we have showed it that we can decouple in Sweden so you're my message to you because we need the business and we need to reduce business impact and we can see that it's profitable and when it's profitable the country get better taxes and when we get better taxes we get better welfare and when we get better welfare yes we get happier people so please work with incentives to get business to work with this then we will get a better word thank you take action to reduce extreme inequality because it is out of control it's widening it's hurting our economy slowing our economies it's undermining democracy it is trapping people in poverty our research highlights worrying levels of inequality and our stats show the rich continuing to pull away from the rest and rising inequality damages our economic social and environmental prospects Inequality is definitely getting worse in a lot of countries and you're seeing the, the super rich in particular move away from the rest of society. Collectively, human beings live longer, healthier, richer, secure, freer, and more educated lives than at any point in human history. Inequality is simply not the defining issue of our time as it was falsely stated in this video. 
It seems that the proponents of this thesis do not sufficiently disentangle global income inequality from national income inequality and income inequality from wealth inequality. What has transpired in several countries, such as the United States of America or China, where, the, where income inequality has been on the rise, in other parts of the world, in Latin America, across the EU27, income inequality has dropped. And we shouldn't mistaken uh, the rise of income inequality in the United States for a global trend, since if we look at the global income inequality, it's, it has been sharply reduced over the past 30, 35 years on the wings of globalization. And we can observe this if we look at the income share captured by the world's bottom 50% and at the same time if we look at the income share captured by the 10%, top 10% and top 1%. What is also really important, we should differentiate between wealth inequality and income inequality. And some of the most egalitarian countries in the world, such as Denmark and Sweden, have a comparatively and relatively higher wealth inequality rates. What is also really important to say, the composition of today's wealth is made primarily of financial assets and the link from financial assets and the control over them to the control over real or physical resources which are essential for the personal well-being are not, is not as straightforward as it was 100 years ago. Even if this were not the case, and even if we abstract from the Oxfam's flawed methodology, which actually treats a Princeton Medical School graduate with a student loan as a poorer and more deprived person than a, uh, than, than a farmer from Malawi, uh, people who find themselves today at the bottom of the wealth ladder still live immensely better lives than their predecessors 150 or even 30 years ago. What is also important to say, fi to say finally, uh, the relationship between progress and inequality is not linear. I think we should differentiate between good and bad inequality on the same model like we differentiate between good and bad cholesterol. So, bad inequality, I will give you an example. Bad inequality is inequality created by rigged market structures, by cronism, by corruption, by clientelism and other social pathologies. And we definitely have in our toolkit policy measures which can address those challenges by decisive fight against corruption or introducing pro-market and not pro-business reforms. And when it comes to good inequality, we shouldn't panic about it because good, good income inequality is created when we have major technological breakthrough. And in the short run, disruptions always create losers and winners, but in the long run, all profit and total social and economic welfare is enhanced. Similar when uh, we have the change in the way how societies are organized. When you have rising urbanization levels in the developing countries, you also get, at first, good inequality. Later on, it is reduced. I will reiterate, inequality is not a defining issue of our time. Solving the pockets of extreme poverty and lifting millions of people across the globe in low-income and low-middle-income countries, as well as fighting climate change is a true generational issue. Capitalism, as it was stated in this video, does not thrive on poverty. Capitalism allows us to solve our collective problems. How? It allows us to set better market prices, which are more efficient, bring more efficiency, as opposed to prices set by state planners. It boosts productivity growth. And finally, it's better at rationing risk that is so tightly intertwined with society's innovation capacity. I would like to paraphrase a famous line from Monty Python's Life of Brian. What has the capitalism done for us, apart from making us richer, healthier, and secure. Unfortunately, the degrowth de movement, which gathers environmentalists and egalitarians, wants to tear down the very system that has brought us so vast improvements over the last century, as well as it has proven capable to reform itself in the periods of excesses like financial instability or inequality. I would like to finish with a positive tone and with a positive message, since we lack this kind of approach. I'll just give a couple of names 
of private companies and private initiatives which provide us with solutions to our pressing problems. So Dendra system, which uses seed-firing drones to actually plant thousands of trees a day, it's a new innovative project with, which helps us fight deforestation. Sanivation, which uses human poo to produce fuel for poor Kenyan households. Rapis waste to energy facility, the first of its kind in Africa, which turns waste into cheap energy for Addis Abeba's poor households. Or blockchain technology, which helps us to fight overfishing in the Pacific Ocean. We need to shed more media light on successful stories like that. And we should create more business-friendly ecosystems across the globe within, within which uh, problem solvers similar to the aforementioned ones can blossom, thrive, and help us tackle the problems. I'm deeply confident that we can excel at it by fostering cross-sectoral and cross-national cooperation and building mutual trust. So let's embrace this unique opportunity for our sake and for the sake of our posterity. Thank you so much. Hello, my friends. Um, my name is Alan Kerrigan, I'm the Executive Director of the European Liberal Forum, but I'm also a victim. I'm a victim to my own psychology, my own psyche, and I'm also a victim to something that we see every day, and as negative media bias. We have heard great example of how the world could be better and is a lot better, but while the world is getting better and Effectively, we live at the best times for humans of being alive. We are in constant loop of scare and doubt. The most prominent worries revolve around climate change, security, and whether or not your generation will be better off than your parents. So if that is what Christian said is true, if global poverty has fallen by half in the last 20 years, why are only 20% of Americans be able to say that, to distinguish that, and to notice that. Why do they think that this is actually the opposite is the case, that they think it has improved? This cannot be simple arrogance. The late Hans Rosling performed the so-called chimpanzee test to determine misconceptions about the world. The result? By guessing randomly, chimpanzees are more likely to correctly answer questions about the state of the world than humans do. So basically, you are very pessimist apes, and so am I. It becomes even more interesting when you look at optimism on global development on a worldwide scale. As a rule of thumb, the more developed and rich a country is, the more pessimistic it is about the future. Asking whether their children be, are financially better than their parents, only 14% in France say they will, compared to whooping 91% in Vietnam. The world is not getting worse. It is just getting more complex. People have to make sense of so much more information, a constant stream of new information. And here we are run into a fundamental problem, media and psychological mechanisms. As humans, we are really good at noticing threats, weaknesses, and making connections. We are hardwired for negative information. Negative sticks to us, positive bounces off. Being wide this way is actually pretty good for you and for me from an evolutionary perspective. Just imagine, and it's not very hard, that I'm a caveman and I'm coming out of my cave on a bright sunny day, but there's also a tiger looking at me very hungrily. It is beneficial for me to first notice the tiger and not that it is a bright sunny day and take actually precautions about that. So. Right now, we are constantly bombarded by these threat levels, and our poor, poor brains have to make sense of that. 
Our stress levels are up, our stress response are permanently up. And there another survival instinct of our brain kicks in. We base our base, a sense of risk and danger on anecdotes and images that are available from memory. So it's a mental shortcut, basically, to assess a uh, situation. So we prioritize noticing negative phenomena over positive, so we can actually benchmark and evaluate other phenomena that are coming. And Daniel Kahneman says, people tend to assess the relative importance of issues by the ease with which they can retrieve from memory. And this is largely determined by the extent of media coverage. So the more media coverage there is, the more an extensive issue is talked about, the more urgent you perceive it. Remember the tiger. The data scientist, Kalef Litaru, used um, something called da uh, data sentiment mining, uh, sentiment mining, which assesses the tone of articles of news items. He did that for the New York Times for articles between 40, 1945 and 2005, and he found out that there was an increasing negative bias that was coming up. And this is not only true for that, also if you look on a more global scale, and he did that in 130 countries um, for a period of 40 years, the same was true for that. So whilst everything is getting better, while does media still say it's getting worse? Why do we have the perception that it's like that? So there's this perpetuum mobile of negative bias that's going on. Worst case scenario like extinction of species or increasing equality just make catchy headlines. Media, especially on climate, is concentrating on problems and neglecting solutions. Looking at the archives, uh, journalists would easily see that we all already had this discussion with the Club of Rome and others. In times where traditional and social media are fighting about attention and who gets um, information out the fastest, a tweet can make headlines, even though it might be debunked just five minutes after that. But there is this shred of information that keeps stuck in your brain. And there's this very dis uh, important distinction between correlation and causality that also gets lost. Just imagine the headline, horse owners live longer than non-horse owners. So is it the horses that make you healthier, or is it more likely that you can uh, afford health care if you also can afford a horse. But this is also um, not talked about. But with, guess which one would be in the media more? Bad news is selling better than good one. Nobody cares about the 40 million airplanes that land safely each year. It's the one that doesn't that makes the headline. And in the highly competitive media market, you have to stand out. Our brains are evolutionary relics. And in a world with food scarcity and tigers, that has a psychological uh, uh, advantage. But the risk is smaller than just 100 years ago. We are problem-focused on old problems while being on top of the Maslow pyramid. And this is especially dangerous when we're getting used to things. Um, you know how angry you get when Netflix is lagging. When I was young, um, I had to physically walk to the blockbuster, get the video, and sometimes it wasn't there. But on a more serious scale, um, in the West it's normal that you're sick, you go to a doctor. If you are in childbed, your child and you as a woman, you probably won't die. As a woman, you have the same rights as men. But this is nothing that comes for granted. There has been a long development for that. Since when is that the case? Case. We have lost perspective and we have fallen into an instant gratification trap. Getting frustrated when desired change is not happening right now. And this is something that you can see very well in the climate discussion that we have now. That is why you have the system discussion as well. We lack a positive vision of the future. Look at politics, media, only dystopian scenarios and strong people who want to take the burden off of you. Um, and this is something that we need to fight as liberals and libertarians. Humans are not rational beings, no matter how much you would like them to be. Just imagine the discussion that you had all on the dinner table when talking about economic models and how a free market is more beneficial for everyone. And what is the response that you get? An emotional answer, think about the children who built the roads. This is what you get on the other side. So this leaves us with two conclusions, and that is what I want to end with. Target the hearts, not only the minds of people. And if they are not falling for the libertarian utopia, try something like a protopia. 
It's neither dystopian nor utopian, because neither of those is a very likely scenario. But we can say that the problems we will have in the future and the suffering that there will be will be much less than it is right now, just as it is right now much less than it was in the 1900s. Nothing will be in perfect harmony, but things will be much better than they are right now. Thank you. I would like to start with the polls, actually, because they are the most important ones for now. Uh, I'll start with Nina, because she went first. Uh, so we asked this, our followers, at least students here, that do you think humanity will manage to keep global warming under two degrees? And 54% of our students here said yes, and 46% of them said no. What do you think about this? For 46 percent. Um, glad to see that was the response for, for that we should manage to stay below two degrees because it's a huge difference between one and a half and two degrees uh, just looking at the planet. So, uh, and what IPCC, the UN uh, Climate Group, said it's really, really important to both reduce and to have negative emissions, that we need that. And it, it, as I showed, it's not so far away, but we need help from policy, and it's so important that you try to move the people you know around you and that you move policy. So we get the policy. For negative emissions, we need incentives, and we also need, need um, uh, smart regulations or that is aligned with the market economy like EU ETS and the carbon tax and away with all the subsidies in oil and coal. So, but uh, I hope uh, the 54% are right. All right, thank you very much. And the next poll was about the income equality. Mm -hmm. So we asked our followers, your followers and our mm -hmm. students, that are you worried about income equality? And 40% of them said yes. Mm -hmm. And 60% of, of them said no. Mm -hmm. What would you like to? Well, I would like to reiterate what I said in the talk, that it's uh, essential to differentiate between bad and good in income inequality. So if the system is strict, for instance, we have a lot of evidences that, for instance, in, in the United States, over the last 40 years, rising inequality has not been due to, for instance, globalization primarily, but primarily due to the rise of impact of organized interest groups which have access points to the political system in Washington, and they, they actually tilt the level playing field in their favor. So we should be concerned about that kind of inequality. But when it comes to income inequality, uh, which, is, uh, which arises from some new major technological breakthrough, yes, well, we should uh, try to compensate the losers, but we shouldn't panic about it and try to forcefully diminish Gini coefficients, which is a measure of income inequality, or if suddenly, for instance, the share of the income that goes to the top 1% and top 5% rises for three or four percentage points, well, let's not panic immediately. Let's see uh, what are the processes behind. So if you have uh, tilted or tilted markets and rigged political systems, yes, then we have to regulate lobbying in a better fashion. If it's something which, if income inequality arises from the entrepreneurial spirit, so for instance, you have amazing innovations which help us all to thrive and to solve our daily problems, then we shouldn't actually panic, well, why this guy actually earned $1 billion? Well, this guy actually helped you to live better lives. So I think we should really differentiate between those two things, uh, and I think in that regard we shouldn't uh, 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 give too much credit to this Oxfam, po Oxfam posters, which I saw a lot of them in the Madrid metro when I was heading to this conference place. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and our last poll was about the media. So the question we asked was, do you think the media writes too much about negative news? And uh, the poll was very really clear about that. 94% of our students said yes. <laughs> How would you like to read that, Daniel? Well, we are on the same page. Um, <laughs> but the, th the problem here is good news is no news for a large extent. I'm talking about 
daily we've lifting 185,000 people in, out, out of poverty. Doesn't really catch you, does it? Um, why is there, when there is no news, um, this search for anything that happened anywhere? If you look at the German Tagesschau, for instance, and there's nothing happening, then you have the discussion about there has been a bus crash, a crash in the Philippines with five dead. Okay, what is the informational value for me in this moment? Nothing. The only thing that it does, it scales up my anxiety level potentially when I go on the bus. And it's like, like it, uh, a funnel of information that goes into your brain with all, and there's a certain, let's call it a certain tank that you have. And you get fed more and more information. There's a bus crash there, there's a plane crash there, there's another accident there that you've been talking about. And that builds a certain bias in your head that you call on at a certain point. When you go on a plane, when you go on a bus, when you buy something, when you make a voting decision. And this is something that is extremely dangerous. There are a couple of publications out there who concentrate on good news, but they're struggling to sell. Because again, no new, uh, good news is very often no news. And this is something that we need to change, number one, by actually making an economic decision, free market after all, to buying these kind of publications, but also making use of us as individuals promoting those ideas. And as I said in my intervention, it is very often not the minds that we have to target, it's the hearts. We are here a lot of people who are very rational. We are libertarians, that's our thing. Um, a lot of Randians, here. That's your thing. But maybe discussing with people about cold facts only and live free or die might not get you the support and the convincing power of the better argument that you might need. Thank you very much. That was pretty explanatory. So we have a question from one of our audience. They're asking probably to Nina. What's your opinion about the global greening caused by higher CO2 emissions? Doesn't that have a positive impact on, in the economy? I didn't hear the first part. Uh, what's your opinion about the global greening mm -hmm. uh, caused by the higher CO2 emissions? Global greening? So uh, what do you mean by that? Global greening? Um, higher CO2 levels uh, used to more photosynthesis and therefore lead to more greening globally through uh, higher CO2 levels habitable uh, areas are expanding towards the more northern southern part. Okay, sorry, sorry, yeah. <laughs> uh, we do need to, um, uh, you know, right now uh, the emissions are getting bigger and not during the corona because uh, the Chinese uh, coals are halving their emissions right now. So, uh, and uh, Looking at, uh, if you take the south and the north perspective, uh, we have the biggest, uh, biggest, been the biggest contributors in the north. So of course we have to take a big responsibility, and uh, and uh, we have also the innovation and a lot of things. So we need to help uh, help out more, and we have a big responsibility, and that we can also see in the negotiations uh, globally. I don't know if I responded to your, to your questions, but I think we have a big responsibility. Of course, everybody has a big responsibility on Earth, but I think we have a big responsibility if we have been big emitters. Thank you very much. Well, that is a response. Sorry for not understanding the question totally. <laughs> so. so we have a couple of questions, but I'm going to uh, mix two of them. So the question asks, has the media gotten worse in the past few years, or has it always been on this level of sensation journalism as we see today? And also somebody else is asking, do you think the coverage about coronavirus is too negative or too positive? Um, as Lufthansa canceled 50% of the flights um, due to a lot of cancellation of people, maybe uh, it is indeed a bit over-exaggerated, but um, as I said, there are studies um, that looked, especially it started with uh, New York Times, looking at the New York Times uh, over a 50-year period, how have the headlines and the articles changed. They're very interesting programs, and I don't want to bother you too much, but they actually automatically read the articles, and therefore, with keywords and sentence structure, 
um, are able to determine the sentiment of an article. Highly interesting, but what's more interesting is indeed the bias that you have. You can see in a uh, negative trend, go, it goes down, um, especially New York Times, then in the 1970s, a little bit upwards, but after that, going down with negative messages, negative messages, negative messages. And indeed, there is too, too much of that. There is almost only negative messages outside. Coronavirus, climate change, this, that, inequality, you always have to keep in mind that these are things that come into the ears, eyes, and brains of people. And as I said earlier, people have to make sense of that, and that life reaches their anxiety. Why do people think that their lives has been better, not only because they were younger back then, but also because things were simpler? It was not so high. And if you, and there's a very interesting, um, a very interesting discussion about that. If you look at TV shows from the 19 70s, 1980s, um, especially, uh, partly from the 1960s. The best one with the most positive vision of the future is Star Trek, by far. And just a short intervention, Star Wars is not science fiction, it's fantasy, but that's just a <laughs> side note. Um, so there is, there was, it's the only one of positive uh, vision. Jetsons, also positive. Everything is better, everything has flying cars. Uh, back to the Future, look at what Marty McFly on his hoverboard and then DeLorean flying through, through the sky. But where is that now? And this is something, again, that is repeated by the media. Things are getting worse. And no one's talking about the reduced child uh, mortality, reduced mother mortality that we have, about all the girls that can go to school now. My mother, until the 1970s, without the consent of the husband, was not allowed to pick up a job or have her own bank account until the 1970s. Just keep that in mind. Thank you very much. I think this gives a good... <laughs> gives us a good perspective of how things are changing, actually. Uh, I have a question to Christian, actually. So, we can all agree that the media likes to... Oops, sorry. That's the other question. The fact that the world has seen progress during the last decades is in itself not a guarantee that we will see progress during the coming decades. What are the biggest reasons to be optimistic about the future, according to you? Well, uh, I think the biggest reason why we should be optimistic is that we have more and more glo globalized and interlocked world. So we have knowledge dissemination. And n never in our history we were able to actually exchange so much information and ideas. And generally, if we are able to exchange multiple ideas from various perspectives, I, I think we can foster a good dialogue in order to get to the best solution for our problems. So I think uh, the, the ascent of internet uh, and the globalization in that regard, digital flows, I think is really enabling us to uh, create better world and create uh, really good solutions. Recently I was in Kenya for a vacation and you know you always have this European perspective well those guys down there are really poor, deprived and you know yes they have a lot of problems that we luckily don't have but I can testify to you that I have seen a lot of hope in their eyes. I have seen a lot of uh, positive stories and those kind of people generally I would say yes uh, they are quite aware of their daily problems, but they have something that maybe we in Europe or the, or the States lack these days. They have this appetite for uh, thriving, they have this optimism vis-a-vis -vis their future. So I think uh, they could learn something from us, how to improve their uh, state structures, how to eliminate corruption, we could and we should and we must assist them in that regard, but still we also have to learn something from them, from them in return and this is this positive uh, attitude towards the future. Thank you very much. So Nina, what do you think in more detail the businesses, or at least politicians, can do to create necessary conditions for businesses to come up with new technologies to combat climate change? Or is there anything that exists? The first thing, put a price on carbon. Um, it shows that uh, that's easy and, that, and that's a general 
uh, incentives that works. So I think that is good. And I just must connect what you've been talking about as well, because we need politicians that are hopeful and that goes for, for the good news and not for the negative news. Because it's easier to make changes if you are on the positive side and, and talk about, you know, we can look at what windmills and solar power, the prices have gone down. They don't need subsidies, but we need to take away the subsidies on fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. So put a price on carbon and then you will see the innovation. All right. Uh, we have a question from our audience. It's a question to all three of you. They're saying, is climate change an issue? If so, can government solve it? So do you believe in climate change? And do you think government can solve this problem? Or cause well, it problem? would be pretty retarded not to believe in climate change. Uh, if you look at the world four billion years ago, it was different than right now. Um, and there is clear evidence that the, that the climate is changing. The question is, what, what causes spikes? And you have seen in the past uh, spikes in, in warming, for instance, with uh, eruption of, of volcanoes, other catastrophes. Um, and right now, we also see spikes. Um, and yes, it is happening. Yes, we should at least do something about the internalization of external effects or potential external effects. And that is actually something very libertarian or liberal to talk about. If you pollute, if you blow something in the air, if you make things worse for others, you have to pay for it. Non-aggression principle, um, even for the hardcore libertarians about you, uh, amongst you. So this non-aggression principle actually would dictate you not to do something like blowing up emissions too much in the air, or if you do, put a price on it, and therefore it's mitigated. So others have indeed an uh, um, uh, advantage. And I couldn't agree more with what you said. Just defund all the subsidies for any of the energy forms, and then we see which one comes forward, yeah. being it um, uh, synthetic fuels that can be done with uh, wind or solar power, or even created in Africa yeah. and to a large extent and give them a competitive advantage over European countries in leaving out um, the bad states who are current, currently supplying us with oil and gas, excluding the US here, of course, but you know who I'm talking about. Great. Well, uh, I discussed this not extensively. Uh, in the, uh, I, 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 I did not cover this topic in detail in the Fear of Future uh, publication, but I mentioned that you, ha you need to have a cooperation between the governments and the markets. So what can the governments do? They should definitely, I agree with Nina, set carbon tax. They should defund this fossil fuel subsidies. And still, they have to step up R&D spending. So this kind of productive spending and not non-productive spending. And generally, governments are really good at non-productive spending. So I think we should have a turnaround with that regard. And we should leave commercialization of products and services that are sustainable to the market forces and to the very private enterprises. So the government creates the framework and then private entities, private businesses, NGOs pick up from there and create the solutions that we definitely need. And, and just, I, we agree a lot here, but I just <laughs> have to say also, talk to each other, take the good examples, use the good examples and uh, don't invent the wheel again. Use the example that are, that are good, that really works in countries. So uh, I'm thinking on, uh, uh, on the target 17 in the global agenda, uh, sustainable development goals. It's about you know, connecting between different levels, talking to research, policy, business. We need to do that, and you talked about mm -hmm. now, now we are in a world mm -hmm. where we can talk to each other, where we have easy information right here. So use it. All right, these are all of the questions we've had, and thank you very much for joining this discussion panel. It's been a great pleasure to moderate the session with you guys. Uh, can we change the slide, actually? So as libertarians, we know there's no such thing as free lunch, but there's always free books if you go to the ELF uh, <laughs> Liberty Fair table, and they will have much more to explain to you and a lot of goodies, I hope, that they will bring it uh, for you. I think Daniel wants to have a little speech. No, I don't want a speech. Um, <laughs> Sorry, one one thing it? that you cannot see there right now, we actually just published, and that is what they, Christian also has been talking about 
a book called Fear of the Future. Um, well, Fear of the Future, Fridays for Future, we've picked up on a lot of their statements, how the world is getting worse, how we will not be able to find a job, how climate change will kill us all. So what are the liberal answers to that? Where is the bias coming from? And why is it actually very reasonable to be an optimist, even though the discussions that we have? Thank you very much. And thank you for joining us. You can go and find your books and publications on the upstairs in Liberty Fair. And I think you can have the lunch as well right now. <laughs>